Welcome everybody to the BDA Midnight Podcast, brought to you by the association, along with Excel Fertilizers and the BDA Foundation. That's right, I'm still going to be making up sponsors as we go along, and you can't stop me. I'm not going to stop now, why should I? Let me tell you something. This BDA Midnight Podcast is being recorded at midnight, unlike the last one I did. As always, I'm going to stay truthful with you guys, I'm going to stay as honest as I can be, and I'm telling you, yes, it is midnight right now, and it's a particularly scary midnight as it's raining outside, there's thunder. Let me tell you what else we can expect. Where else can we expect thunder? It's going to be this Saturday in Montreal, Canada, the great big north. We're going to have Andres from Farah taking on Adonis Stevenson, or maybe it should be the other way around. Adonis Stevenson taking on Andres from Farah. Stevenson, as you may recall, he's still considered by a lot of people on the internet as the lineal champion of the division. Now, of course, on paper, I guess you could say that if you follow the lineage of the title, if you really want to stick to it. Um, I think everybody can agree that Andrew Ward and Sergey Kovalev are the best two light heavyweights. At worst, Stevenson is at number three. He's the third best light heavyweight in the world. And that's no, that's no knock against him. What you can knock, however, is his recent opposition which has been nothing short of, oh man, I mean, am I really going to say it? That's right, I'm going to say it. It's been shameful. It's been a little disgusting. Let's let's face it, guys. It, it's This is a guy who's considered the light heavyweight champion of the world, as I said, but the opposition doesn't quite match that title. Now, of course, one thing I do give him credit for is that he's been knocking people out. And if he doesn't knock him out, he can still beat him decisively. And I, I've talked about this in another podcast that it's his right to do whatever he wants, but it's not... It, 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 just because he can do whatever he wants doesn't mean doesn't shield him from the criticism that fans have to make about him or they have about him. and it's very it's valid criticism that he hasn't fought really anybody of note now of course I give him credit for the fact that he's taking on from Farah as opposed to the initial guy he was going to face which was Sean Monaghan this fight looks like Sugar Ray Leonard versus Tommy Hearns in comparison to that one now, I've, I've also read some people saying, oh, well, it's not that great a fight. It's, I mean, we would rather see Kovalev or Ward take on Stevenson. But come on, let's face it, that fight can't happen right now because Kovalev and Ward are going to be taking on each other in a rematch in July. So that fight's not going to happen, realistically. Down the line, could that fight happen? A fight between Kovalev, Ward, and Stevenson? Um, yeah, Ward is with Rock Nation, and, and the PBC and Rock Nation hate each other. Uh, you know, if the fight makes a lot of money and if there's a lot of demand, maybe they could make it because, you know, money trumps all. All borders, all races, all colors, all creeds. As for a Kovalev-Stevenson f- fight, well, we've been the done that, right? With the negotiations, I'm not going to get into that about who's right, who's wrong. The fact of the matter is that that fight never happened. So uh, would they suddenly make it? I don't know. Stevenson is 39 years old and he has looked at in his past couple of fights <clears throat> against uh, Bika, he he started fading against Fanfara. The first fight, he faded a lot worse. And against Thomas Williams Jr., he had to pull out that one big shot. Now he's a very good fighter, Stevenson, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that later on. But the fact here is, right now he's 39 years old. He wants to make a little money. But I also think that maybe now, hopefully, after this, he he starts taking on some some tougher opposition and and. Apparently, he's got the Alvarez fight. Alvarez, Al- L.A. Der Alvarez, who is fighting on the undercut, by the way. He's poised to take on on uh, Stevenson. So, you know, it's it's still uncertain whether a Kovalev-Ward versus Stevenson fight would ever happen. I don't know. But for the moment, we do have this fight. At least it's not that awful a fight. I'm talking about from Farrah Stevenson. And let's talk about that fight for a second here. Stevenson's days as a champion have been... You know, there's a high and low. Like I said, sometimes he knocks guys out and sometimes he struggles a little bit. But he always comes out on top. And the reason for that is because of that power of his. He's got tremendous punching power and he knows how to use it. From Farah, on the other hand, he's also had his ups and downs, but uh, the lows have been lower than that of Stevenson's. Uh, From Farah has been knocked out twice. He lost to Stevenson. Uh, Right now he's coming in with a little momentum at least. At least you got to give him that to Fonfara. He's coming off a win over Chad Dawson. Now, I know people are going to say, well, Chad Dawson, who cares? Well, Chad Dawson, as far as I can tell, showed up very determined. He looked in shape against Fonfara. It wasn't the same Chad Dawson that fought Thomas Carpensi a couple of years ago. This was a Chad Dawson that really wanted to get back into the title picture at 175. And he was at boxing Fonfara, and then Fonfara caught him with a sensational punch and stopped him. 
The thing I like about Von Fire is that he's a tall, lanky fighter from Europe, from Poland, and usually those guys are straight up stand up boxers or boxer punches. In the case of Von Fonfara, since he moved to the United States and started training with American trainers, he really became more of an inside fighter. And you saw that when he fought Chavez, you saw that when he fought Nathan cleverly in a very good fight. If you like inside punching and uppercuts, that fight had them all. And uh, he's, he's, you know, I guess against Stevenson, he showed a couple of little tricks in there in the first fight. Even shifting, if you, if you remember when he uh, dropped uh, Stevenson, the, the knockdown was preceded by a little shift. Now, for those of you that don't know what shifting is, is when you shift, you switch stances, either backing up or going forward, usually going forward. Gennady Golovkin does that a lot. Um, Dimitri Piron, the, the one of the most underrated boxers that never was. He, he disappeared after a couple of uh, a couple of years ago, actually. But anyway, these guys know how to shift. And, and from far, I'm telling you, he's got little tricks in there. The problem is going to be is that he's an inside fighter. And in order to get inside on Stevenson, you got to pa- walk past that big left hand of his. Stevenson has a very uh, simple style, but when I say simple, that doesn't necessarily mean easy to decipher. What he'll do is he'll jab, 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 you know, sort of, he, he won't really be a hard jab. It will be more something to distract you. He'll go up and down, he'll go up, up, down. Sometimes he'll jab upstairs and throw the left hand downstairs. And when the guy's least expected, he'll either throw a one, two, or maybe just a single left hand upstairs, and he catches guys' attention. The other thing he does very well is Usually when he's fighting right-handers, he takes a little step back when his opponent throws a one-two and he counters with the left hand. You know, guys, when they taste that kind of left hand, they usually go, ooh. They rethink about throwing, letting their hands go because they know they're going to get countered with a heavy left hand. And if they keep on going, a lot of these guys end up getting knocked out. Uh, against Von Farah, in the first fight, Stevenson tired. And he was, but he did show some inside fighting, just like he did with Thomas Carpensi. He showed that when he's on the inside, he will he will let that right hook to the body go, and that left uppercut is just, I mean, that left hand period is 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 killer for him. Like I said, however, the problem with Stevenson is that he tends to fade a little bit. When he fought Saikyo Bika, who's really is he's a super middleweight, always has been. He went up up uh, Bika went up against Stevenson, and again he got dropped. And that happens with everybody Stevenson fights, really. He'll either KO you or at least knock you down or hurt you. He's got that type of power. So when he fought Bika, he was doing very well. He was outboxing Bika. And then by the eighth round, started fainting a little bit. And that is worrisome when you when, when he's when you think about a, the guy he's going to fight right now. Because yes, Fanfara is chinny. He's got a weak chin. He can be knocked out. And in fact, he was dropped a couple of times against Stevenson in the first fight. One of them was a body shot, but still, I mean, that, what I'm saying is here is that Stevenson can get to him. And, uh, and, and Stevenson, that's the problem. He's a big, big puncher. So if, you're, if you have um, a weak chin, well, I mean, what do you think is going to happen against Stevenson? I expect Fanfara to get hurt. Well, that's what Fanfara has to do. He has to come in here knowing that A, the first Stevenson fight happened three years ago. He's only gotten better from, from since that fight. That's why he has to tell himself. I'm not saying that that's really what's going on here, but I mean, if I'm in from Fonfara's shoes, this is what I got to be thinking. A, I'm better than I was three years ago. B, this guy fucking tires. Three, yeah, he's got power, but I can weather it. I already did it once. Four, you know, I got better stamina than him. He's going to fade. That's what he needs to think about. He needs to take Stevenson into the late waters. Easier said than done, because Stevenson will outbox you and he will hit you with those heavy hands. And if you're not careful, he might just take you out at any moment. But Fanfara has a good shot here. Stevenson, again, 39 years old. The Thomas Williams fight was a bit of a of a rough uh, outing for him. Could have taken a couple of years off his career. So you never know, man. This, I mean, this is a fight that, again, it's not Stevenson versus Ward or Kovalev or even Beterbiev. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Why not? It's a good fight. What else about that fight? It was two years ago. So yeah, Fanfara needs to take him deep. But like I said, hey, that power from Stevenson... My goodness gracious. Now, of course, down the line, we all want to see Stevenson versus Kovalev. That would be a great fight, by the way. I mean, the build-up to that fight, Stevenson, Kovalev. Can you imagine Kovalev, you know, Stevenson guarding uh, Kovalev forward during the, during the press conference, and then finally Kovalev just snapping, saying, you know what, maybe I am a racist. So what? What are you going to do about it? What? You're gonna, somebody going to send me to jail? I'm from Russia, for Christ's sake. What are you going to do about it? And then Stevenson cracks himself and starts calling uh, uh, Koval of a honky. I mean, that would be a great. That would people would lose their shit because they would say, "Oh, that's you know racism on both sides." But hey, come on, let's be honest about it. A little racism is always entertaining. 
pre prior to a build up for a fight. Hey, remember Jerry Cooney versus Larry Holmes? Neither of those guys really wanted to get into it. I I, I remember I read a, an interview with Larry Holmes where he said he didn't care for all that racial stuff. Neither did Jerry Cooney, but it was the people around them that made it racial. In fact, I think it was also Don King was one of the ones that really pushed that angle. So hey, why not? Everybody's always talking about race, and I, I so why not make it that that way prior to the fight? But again. Is that fight even going to happen? Kovalev Stevenson or Ward Stevenson? I could I could see that fight getting racial as well. Why not? I'm talking about Ward Stevenson, by the way. It could get racial. Trust me. Uh, Ward is half Irish or half white or whatever he is. So let's make it racial a little bit. You know, make things interesting a little bit. A little pizzazz. That's what they do in the UFC all the time. UFC, which, by the way, has a good uh, card coming up. But those guys in the UFC, they're more... They're unleashed, man. They'll say what, whatever they want to say. Now, of course... Maybe they say a little something that goes too far and, and, and the UFC clamps down and forces them to issue a statement or an apology or something. But for the most part, those guys know how to talk. Here, who do we have? We have Angel Garcia. And whenever he acts like a nut job, people start saying, oh, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's reprehensible. I mean, I'm not condoning the behavior, but you have to be a liar if you're going to tell me that that doesn't add a little interest in the game here. And that's what this is. Boxing, people say, well, it's not a sport, it's a combat sport, it's a game. Trust me, you gotta know how to play the game in order to make it, both inside and outside of the ring. All right, so now on the undercard in Montreal, on the undercard of Stevenson from far, we also have Jean Pascal taking on Elader Alvarez. Now, Alvarez is a bit of an unknown commodity for a lot of fans because he's not as talked about as Baturbiev or Kovalev or Ward or Stevenson. But the guy can crack, as he showed against Lucien Boutin in his last fight. He's got pretty good boxing skills. He can roll with shots. He can. He's pretty good defensively. He can jab. He's a. He's a pretty all-around solid boxer, and he's hungry for a fight here. He was supposed to fight Stevenson, but Stevenson opted for a for a uh, to to pay him an aside fee so that he would you know, step aside. So Alvarez is fighting his time now. He took on Butte. Now he's taking on Jean Pascal, two of the biggest stars from the last few years in Quebec. But of course now Butte, well, you know, he lost a couple of fights. Now he's he lost by knocking against Alvarez, so who knows? And Pascal, a lot of people think that he's finished. We'll get into that more a little bit. But I I, I want to talk about Alvarez. I think he's a very good fighter. If you watch the Chilemba fight, I haven't really seen it. That, I've seen it twice, and every time I've seen it, I think that Chilemba got the better of of Alvarez. But it was a very close fight, so I don't mind the decision. That being said. Uh, Alvarez does have a problem in fading. That was his biggest, one of his be most arduous fights so far. Arduous in the sense that he really had to be sharp against Chilemba, and uh, he he faded a little bit. Even the, I think it was I remember when I was watching the fight live, I started thinking, oh wait a minute, he's fading. And then the commentator said it, and I said, yep, he's he's fading. Jean Pascal, he's not. A volume puncher. He's not Antonio Margarito. He's not Wayne McCullough. He's not, uh, uh, you know, he's not a volume puncher. So you, if you think he's gonna outwork Alvarez, that's that's not how the fight is gonna go. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I think when you talk about this fight, you also always obviously you have to address Pascal. A lot of people think he should retire, and I'm not one of these negative Nellies who every time a guy loses more than two fights in a row, so he goes, "Oh, they have to retire. They have to retire. He's shot. I'm, I'm afraid for his life." I'm not usually one of those guys. Listen, this is, these people are grown men. They want to live their lives this way. They want to get into it. They want to. They want to uh, trade punches for a living, and they want to keep going. It takes a certain mentality to be able, a certain mentality to be able to be in this game, as dangerous as it is, and love it. And these people, they they choose that. So he's, you know, Jean Pascal. He's he, he he. You gotta allow him to do what he's gotta do. That being said, I do think that this is one of those cases where the guy has to rethink about continuing with his career, or at least take a long break, man. Because first of all, okay, after the Kovalev fight, he took some hellacious shots. If it wasn't for that chin of his, he would have gone out like Sal Ismail Salik or or some all, all the other guys that Kovalev fought, uh, Nathan Cleverly. Sometimes a chin, a, a granite chin can be a curse. And it was a curse in the, in the Kobler fight because he took a hellacious amount of punishment. So he goes up against Unieski Gonzalez. Unieski Gonzalez, who, by the way, you know, gave him a tough fight. A lot of people thought he won. And then it turns out Unieski Gonzalez, not really that great a fighter. So it makes Pascal look even worse. I mean, 
uh, Gonzalez lost against Rebranski, who's not a bad fighter, but he did make a lot of flaws. He did have a lot of demonstrate a lot of flaws against Barrera in their slugfest, and then he took he lost to uh, to Alexander Gvozik, who, by the way, I think is could potentially be the best light heavyweight down the line. Of course, it's gonna, it's gonna the chances of that happening are kind of murky, considering that there's Andrew Ward and Sergey Kovalev in that division. But he really, I mean, that's how high I think. Of, of Gubozic. He's a very talented fighter and very skilled. But what I'm trying to say is that Unieski Gonzalez, you know, if he loses against Gubozic, okay, but Shabansky made him look like an amateur. I mean, and we're talking about a Cuban here, Gonzalez, who wasn't the part of the Cuban amateur system. So you, you expect him to be... A, no, he was flailing around. He was, you know, falling forward. He didn't know how to, how to cut off the distance against Shabansky. So I'm thinking, how good is Gonzalez? And by the same token, how shot is Jean Pascal? And then Pascal goes in against Kovalev in a rematch. And really, it was one of those fights where he takes a beating. And you would have hoped he didn't have as good a chin. Because compared to the first fight, this was a shellacking. He really he was blinking. You know, when a guy is taking shots and he doesn't look tired, but he just looks lethargic, like he's hypnotized, like he's daydreaming, that's a dangerous fight right there. Now, Jean Pascal, I got to check something out here. What was his... His last fight was against a really a no-hoper, uh, Ricardo Marcelo Ramayo, and he TKO'd, Pascal TKO'd Ramayo. So, you know, it was a, it was really a confidence booster, this one. I mean, it was it was a confidence booster in the sense that it was just a fight to get him to, to knock the guy out and maybe think, oh, man, yeah, I still got it, I still got it. I guess Alvarez, we're going to see if he still has it. Conventional wisdom, conventional thinking says, well, listen, he struggled, Pascal, at this, against Gonzalez, How's he going to do against Alvarez, who is a more technically precise and sound fighter? I don't know. But like I said, one thing that I do give credit to Pascal, he's got a lot of his outside the ring antics rub people the wrong way in Quebec. But I always, and, and it's interesting because when he lost to Bernard Hopkins in 2011, at that time, Boutte was the darling of Quebec. Everybody loved him. Nobody had a bad thing. I, I, nobody that I know of had a bad thing to say about Booty. And when Pascal lost to Hopkins, my God, people came out of the woodwork saying that Pascal was an amateur. He didn't know how to box. Of course, forgetting that he gave Hopkins a pretty good fight. It's not like he was completely outboxed for 10, 12 rounds. He did give as good as he, as he took. He was just, you know, Hopkins just was able to shut him down for most of the fight. But people were saying that. And then every time people shit on Pascal, they would say, Booty, on the other hand, boy, that's the guy you got to watch. He's a skilled fighter, this, this, and that. And then what happened in 2012? Booty gets knocked out by Froge. And then Pascal, you know, all of a sudden you go, hey, Pascal never got knocked out when he fought Froge. He, he, they were, those two went to war. They rumbled. And, and, and then... Pascal beat Boutte in 2013 and all of a sudden, or was it 2014? 2000, no, 2014, I believe. So now all of a sudden you go, well, I guess Boutte wasn't that good. And in hindsight, people shitting on Pascal were wrong because Pascal t takes on everybody. Look at the list. He went to England to face Carl Froch. And I, recently we had Errol Spence do the same thing and everybody gave him credit for that. And if Pascal would have been more famous, people would have given him the same credit. And you got to give him the same credit, now that I mentioned now that you know, you got to give him credit. And if you don't give him credit, I don't know what to tell you. Pascal took on Froge, went over there in England. Lost the fight, but it was a sensational fight. One of the most underrated fights of 2008. And then he takes on Chad Dawson. Takes on Andre, Andre, uh, Diakono two times. Takes on Hopkins twice. He takes on Kovalev. He, I mean, this guy, he's taking on everybody. He's got no fears. That's why he's stepping up against Alvarez. He really wants to get back on the, in... in he wants the limelight to be on him, the spotlight. He wants it on him. And he's taking on a dangerous guy here. Alvarez can punch. People say, well, Boot is not really that durable a fighter. People remember the Liberato Andrade debacle where he should have been stopped. People remember how Carl Frosch walked through him. But uh, Badu Jack couldn't stop him. Diguel couldn't stop him. So, so what this demonstrates is that Alvarez has very good power and he also knows how to box. Pascal, on the other hand, like I said, might be shot. Most likely, I would have to, if I had to bet, I would say he is shot. But you never know. Hey, history, the history of boxing is replete with boxers that everybody thought were finished. And then they step into a dangerous fight and everybody goes, oh, he shouldn't do it. You know, they start pleading for the guy to pull out of the fight f because they're afraid for his, for, the, for his life. And then the guy that everybody thought was going to get his ass kicked comes in and he's the one doing the ass kick. A, a couple of examples. Eric Morales, everybody thought he was shot. 
after the David Diaz war he had and after being stopped twice by Pacquiao and losing to Zahir Rahim. So what does he do? He takes a time, a little time off, gets fat. Then little by little, he starts getting back into shape, takes on a couple of no-hopers. And before you know it, he's trading blows with Marcus Maidana, who's bigger and younger, by the way. And a harder punch. Or, you know, if you want to go back to the classics, a little bit, Larry Holmes. Everybody thought he was done for after he fought Mike Tyson. And he takes on Ray Mercer. And people are actually pleading. I think some people were even, I don't know how far they went, but there were boxing writers were aghast at the thought of Mercer and Holmes fighting. And what happened? Holmes pulled a, like a lighter version of uh, Ali Foreman and he beats Mercer. And then you have Holyfield, of course, against Mike Tyson, probably one of the most famous cases of a guy that everybody's afraid for and they think he's shot. And then he takes Mike Tyson out. And in the rematch, we all know what happened. So you you get what I'm saying, guys. Yeah, it's, 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 sometimes you, we, we tend to over-exaggerate. And this is going to show us whether Pascal is short or not. One thing I like about Pascal is that he still has hand speed. Or maybe he's, he does, I don't know. Against Gonzalez, he's still demonstrating hand speed. It was just, you know, he's... He's a very sloppy guy, Pascal. As much as I, I, I give him credit for taking all comers, you also have to criticize his lack of, of, of technique, man. He sometimes he'll flail, he'll, he'll barge forward like a bull with his head forward. That's why headbutts happen sometimes. Remember the Chad Dawson fight? And those technical shortcomings are the reason why Bernard Hopkins was able to outbox him. Some people even say twice. So we'll see what happens. I think it's a pretty good card. We also have UFC that night, like I mentioned before. I know I don't know how many of, of the BDAers out there are MMA fans. I know some boxing fans hate MMA. I l like MMA. I was gonna say love it. No, I like it. I don't like it as much as boxing. If I had to choose between one or the other, I usually will go with boxing. But MMA, come on, it's a good fight. Aldo Holloway. There's also some football, aka soccer, that day. I believe it's that day, right? The Champions League final: Juventus versus Real Madrid. Who? Gonna be a corker. I hope it's not a boring, boring match. Of course, I know some people would say boring, soccer boring. I mean, isn't that a little bit redundant? And yeah, I would agree. Sometimes these guys played a little too safe. Hopefully, neither from Farah Stevenson, Pascal, or Alvarez played safe. But that was another edition of the BDA Midnight Podcast. Guys, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. If you have any comments, you know, go ahead and leave them. Of course, I know you guys always leave comments. Subscribe, like the video. And uh, you tell me, is Pascal shot? You tell me, is Stevenson from Farah going to be a great fight? Is Stevenson, has Stevenson been uh, unfairly criticized by the boxing fans and media alike? Go ahead and feel free to tell me everything that you're thinking about. And uh, I'll read it. I'll always read the comments. And I always try to reply to all of them. Sometimes I don't know what to reply, so I won't reply. And uh, sometimes the comments are a little too cryptic, weird, or uh, creepy. Let's be honest. Yeah, they're a little creepy. And right now it's, it's raining with thunder out there. So uh, it's not as exactly the best moment to be reading creepy fucking comments. But anyway, guys, it was a BDA comment. Uh, BDA comment. Come on. What's going on here? It was a BDA Midnight Podcast. All right. Hey, it's midnight. Every once in a while I make mistakes. BDA Midnight Podcast. We will see you on the next one.